Well, it's a great pleasure, Jeremy, to see you again after these years in Cambridge here and, and have a chance to ask you one or two questions about your career in anthropology. Um, you were born in 1928 in England and you are the author of a number of distinguished works on saints and fireworks, how far we can friend to friends. This is why we wanted to talk to you. Um, you were educated in the United States where you read French and economics. How is it that you came to be an anthropologist or to? Well, I think uh, probably two reasons. The fact that I was an outsider for many years, uh, both in the United States. I was the Dutchman because I had lived in Holland. My father was Dutch. And then when I lived in Holland, uh, I was the American. So I was always an outsider looking in. I think that was the first uh, thing that made me start asking questions about why people are different. So you had the comparative perspective, if you like, built in at a very early age. And secondly, the uh, work I had with CARE, which is an American uh, relief welfare organization, and uh, with them I had was stationed in uh, uh, Philippine, Japan, India, and uh, eventually Malta. And also very much as a, an outsider looking and having to deal with uh, uh, people uh, whose customs I knew very little about, but uh, in order to do my work properly, I had to learn more about them and uh, spend time talking to people, but also uh, reading and uh, then also uh, meeting anthropologists in the field. And one of the supervisors I had when I was in Japan uh, had uh, studied for three, four years with Boas and uh, told me, well, things that I was interested in were anthropological questions. And um, I suppose, again, the uh, an another influence was Lawrence Wiley, who was the author of The Village in Vaucruz, who was my French uh, tutor of teacher at Haverford College, and uh, became uh, interested in the social aspects of uh, what makes French people different from uh, Americans. So these were some of the influences. You mentioned Wiley. Were there, and Boaz, who do you think among anthropologists, living more dead, has influenced you most in your work? But the first, the, yeah, the first books I read on anthropology, I was stationed in Malta at the time with care, and uh, the only thing available in the library there were a book by uh, Carlton Kuhn and uh, and uh, Kimball, Kuhn and, Kuhn and Kimball on uh, human interaction. It was a textbook, and uh, they had very much an interactionist approach. But I think and that I read because there was nothing else to read, and uh, uh, that was two years before I left care and studied anthropology. I think that was an Im important influence, although something I became aware of much, much later. And uh, in terms of the teachers living or dead, I think, uh, I suppose the most important influence uh, in many, many respects is Raymond Firth, who ran the seminar that I attended for two years at the London School of Economics, three years really, uh, although he was away one of those years, several months. and. Uh, the uh, work that I read when I was a student, uh, and his works when I read them didn't influence me as much as the questions and the sort of orientation he had in the seminar. But the, uh, of the books I read, I think the one I, in retrospect, uh, found most important, uh, and I've reread, and uh, is uh, Edmund Leach's book, Political Systems of Highland Burma, in which I find you have, uh, in embryo form, uh, uh, very much what I think of as a transactionalist approach, uh, looking at uh, not necessarily moral systems and, and, and rules of uh, residence as something God-given coming down uh, uh, unchanged, but very much influenced by people competing for prestige, power. And his other book uh, on uh, uh, Sri Lanka, Polilia, uh, but particularly political systems. I think those two uh, if I can look back, and then later, of course, uh, uh, Barth's work, but that was 1963, his, uh, his Models of Social Organization, uh, I had read, and uh, um, theoretically was very interesting, and uh, was tied in with my own interests. Uh, and uh, again, those interests are congruent with uh, a pr an approach that uh, uh, Leach had in, uh, in I think, in uh, political systems, and that uh, came out constantly in the sort of questioning uh, what's in it for them, why do people do things like that, the why question that Firth continually asked at seminars. With your interest in 
and your travels around the rest of the world, it was rather strange that you settled to become one of the founding fathers of Mediterranean anthropology. You and the recent book I read, you and I think it was John Davis, the founding fathers of Mediterranean anthropology. How is it that you settled on Malta, and why did you choose to work there? Well, that was uh, a coincidence. Um, I mean, the last post I had with Keir was in Malta. In Malta, uh, life was comfortable. It was a very pleasant, small uh, island. And uh, when I, uh, I then I left Keir to do field work or to, to do uh, graduate work at the London School of Economics, and then was able, uh, what well, wanted to go on into the field. And uh, my first interest was, in fact, uh, Libya. But uh, the logistics of daily life for uh, someone with, uh, we had two children we, uh, at the time, and an extremely limited budget because I was financing myself through university on what I had saved while I was working for care, uh, made it uh, not very feasible to, uh, to work in Libya. It was too expensive and the health situation was such uh, in the field that I didn't feel like risking my family's health to bring them into the field there, which would have meant uh, a split family and, um, and an expensive sojourn. So uh, Malta was a, a place that was uh, uh, available. My uh, relations I had with the colonial office was w were good enough for the lieutenant governor there at the time. And, uh, so I put in a grant for the SSRC and uh, they supported me and with the very shrewd coaching from uh, uh, Lucy Mayer, who was one of the uh, examiners, and uh, uh, I was lucky enough to get it uh, uh, that year. So that's how I went to Malta, and uh, later I went, uh, the year after I finished my thesis, I went to Sicily, and uh, it was then to, to do some work on a community development project that was uh, staggering, and they wanted uh, advice from an outsider. And uh, then I, uh, I began to uh, develop Mediterranean anthropology. European anthropology, but that's another story. Well, we may get on to that. In Malta, um, you were interested particularly in the relation between religion, ritual, and politics. What, looking back over your time, struck you most about your Maltese work? Well, uh, the, the theme that I have, I've, I've returned to two themes constantly in what I've written subsequent to that, and that is the uh, uh, importance uh, uh, of and structure of factions, factionalism. Uh, and uh, the second one is the, uh, uh, the way in which patrons and brokers operate. Both of these themes were very much in evidence in Malta, and uh, something, especially the patronage and the friends of friends bit is something that I had come in contact with as a uh, uh, well, you can say a, a welfare development bureaucrat in uh, various developing countries and, and learning that you had to work through people like that, uh, friends of friends, contacts, people who could introduce you to the minister and uh, pull forward a file from a, a whole stack of papers that you needed intermediaries to uh, and uh, people who were on your side in a bureaucracy to achieve things. So I had, in a way, the uh, been socialized in, uh, into the... Uh, uh, the uh, networks of patronage and, and, and uh, clientelism and uh, brokerage when I was with CARE and uh, so these were familiar themes and uh, when I came out of the field and began to try and make sense of my uh, data on Malta and then later on Sicily I discovered that there was very little written on something that was uh, such uh, in such great evidence in the in the field and um, I began asking questions why had there been nothing written on factions why were temporary coalitions something things that were virtually ignored? Why was there no way of dealing theoretically with patrons and clients? And uh, so this grew out of both my care field work, uh, if you like, and my own uh, field work as an anthropologist in both uh, uh, Malta and, and Sicily. Why, in fact, hadn't these subjects which would, um, helped to bring out in field, and why hadn't they been studied before? Well, I think it's primarily because of the, if you like, the uh, the uh, emphasis in British anthropology at the time on the uh, corporate groups, uh, the Africanist model of lineages and uh, enduring permanent uh, groups, and this uh, formed a, a theoretical basis on which, uh, which we were trained with uh, at the London School of Economics at the time, uh, very heavily influenced with uh, or by uh, uh, African literature, and this the the uh, the. Uh, uh, 
Evans Pritchard's uh, model of the social structure, and uh, there, were, there was very little room in that particular model for uh, yeah, temporary coalitions of people uh, uh, manipulating uh, the resources and opportunities available in their search for power and status. And uh, um, I think this is the primary reason. And I think that the the that was one set, and there's another. People weren't really interested in in, uh, in why questions, but that in a way is uh, slightly different. No, I would say that it was the uh, the dominance of the uh, the structural model of uh, of society, which uh, has little place for uh, um, evolving, emerging uh, social forms, temporary social forms. The emphasis was on chiefs and and formal roles, not on the uh, informal type of organization, although that's not a, a, a proper, uh, a, a, a useful term. And how is it that you think you discovered this? Was it the time you were just after the great period of corporations, or was it that you went to the Mediterranean where these things were even more important and the corporate kinship groups and so on were less important? I think that's uh, that's part of it. At the time, one of the big uh, debates in British anthropology was trying to find room in the whole th kinship theory for a cognitive uh, uh, system of kinship. And uh, uh, from there, it was a, a fairly easy step towards uh, uh, networks and uh, chains of friends of friends. So the, the way had already been opened uh, beyond uh, lineages. And uh, um, that, I think, was, was part of it. People were beginning to ask a series of questions about uh, uh, structural functionalism, things weren't fitting together the way they should. And um, really you can say the time was ripe and uh, um, the both in a way provided some of the uh, ways of uh, looking at these problems theoretically. I think also uh, uh, important for me was the, because uh, I didn't use the network analogy until I started analyzing my data on uh, uh, the migrants uh, Sicilian Italian migrants to Montreal who were uh, linked not in to each other not in formal parishes or communities but they were spread all over the city but there was a whole network of kinship and uh, and uh, if you like uh, links between people who originated from the same towns in uh, in Sicily and suddenly I found that was a, a, a useful way of looking at the structure of uh, uh, if you want to speak of structure, the loose networks of people uh, that bound the uh, Italians in Montreal to each other. If you had to summarize what you, th you think is the most important contribution you've made to anthropology in two minutes, what, what would you like to be remembered? <laughs> so, uh, so far? Uh, a nasty question. Uh, I don't know, I think factions, uh, brokers, and um, Ultimately, I hope also the uh, leg legitimizing uh, an interest in uh, the anthropology of our own society of Europe, and I think I'm, I mean I feel very strongly that anthropology is the study of all mankind, not simply uh, uh, primitive, non-Western, uh, archaic man, but also people around us. And this is something that I have uh, worked hard on in uh, Holland. Anthropology of uh, Europe is a, a legitimate field of interest in Holland, and I think this is a very important. Uh, opening that anthropologists in uh, the Netherlands have uh, to finding employment opportunities um, in, uh, in their own society as anthropologists, looking at problems not only of minority groups but also essential problems within uh, uh, their own society, simply because you need more than a background in, in African or Asian ethnography to understand some of the processes taking place in Western Europe now. And unless you've got some idea of uh, the developments taking place and the way in which uh, uh, Europe, if you like, is, is, is different from uh, uh, Asia or, or Africa, uh, you are at a disadvantage, I think, in carrying out research uh, in uh, Europe. So what I'm saying is that it's not very, it's not always easy or feasible to transplant uh, an anthropologist who's been trained on, uh, say, the Australian Aborigines or an, an uh, African uh, kingdoms to uh, doing research in uh, in Europe. I think there's certain background information and uh, research techniques having done field work in Europe that uh, qualifies them for research, further research, 
as what, what uh, would you say to the most important ones if you're advising a student on researching your what are the topic? Well, the background uh, factors that you mentioned. Well, I think part of the background factors is an awareness of uh, uh, the uh, the history, the way of, uh, Europe is developing. A number of the trends in Europe, uh, I think, are very important. Having also looked at in uh, uh, education at the uh, a number of uh, the uh, uh, trends at the moment. I, for example, am looking at uh, uh, a new development. I think it's a reason, new development of the emergence of uh, small entrepreneurs in uh, Western Europe. Their numbers are not decreasing the way uh, the uh, the Marxist or the the macroeconomic model said they should. In, in fact, there's been a, a new discovery of the economies of uh, uh, small scale of, uh, and uh, you. This is something that uh, I've been uh, looking at and trying to uh, understand why this is uh, taking place, which is meant that you're dealing with the, the emergence of re cottage industrialization of parts of uh, Western Europe and increase in small scale. Uh, uh, manufacturing uh, in Italy, for example, particularly pronounced, but apparently this is taking place in uh, in Spain and Greece, and uh, even to an extent in uh, in the Netherlands. So is this what your current major current interest is at the moment? Or? This is what I'm uh, working on at the moment. Uh, uh, partly because the problem interests me very much. Uh, it's a way of you look a movement from political entrepreneurs to small commercial uh, entrepreneurs. And partly because it is uh, related to these long-term developments I was mentioning. And uh, thirdly, it's an area that I think has got a, uh, uh, a certain practical relevance in the sense that if you can get students working on this, they're working on the actual uh, developments in Western Europe at this time, which I think will help uh, provide them uh, with uh, skills to, uh, that will enable them to get jobs afterwards uh, in this little project that I've been wor working on recently, we've created a number of jobs, so it's partly a, a job creation scheme, but partly because and I'm interested in it. Uh, but you have to make the interest money from the Dutch government to the Dutch government, which means uh, a uh, um, short-term contract, which raises the point of can you uh, keep doing short-term contracts and ever have enough time to think about the results. But that's part of the subject of this conference, isn't it? Yes. Oh. Finally, Jeremy, if you were um, starting all over again, your life all over again, would you be an anthropologist? Oh yes, no, no. I've been something else. I should definitely be an anthropologist. What else so. would you be? Well, I've always been a, uh, a developer, if you like, for five, six years. I uh, uh, travelled around doing something very different from anthropology. And uh, no, I have no uh, regrets about being an anthropologist, and uh, would certainly do it over again if I had the opportunity.